Hi everyone and welcome to our July event, uh, live event for National Sewing Circle. Again, we have the wonderful Nikki LaFoyle with us tonight and she's going to be answering all of your sewing questions, uh, ones you guys have submitted beforehand as well as any you want to ask live over the next hour. Uh, again, you can do that by putting your question into the comment section below this video, but we're going to get right into the questions um, so we can work through as many as we possibly can. So Nikki, our first question comes from Shirley, and she wants to know, where can you purchase really long zippers? <clears throat> really long zippers. Um, well, I know uh, ZipperStop will have, ZipperStop.com online will have zippers up to 36 inches. And they will have them, I think, in both metal teeth and plastic teeth, and they have a bunch of different colors. But uh, PamDamore.com, P-A-M-D-A-M-O-U-R.com, um, she carries in her store lots of notions, but she carries zipper tape by the yard. Um, so up to, I think, three yard, a three-yard length. So you can just cut the length that you need. So instead of, you know, you need a 32-inch zipper or whatever you have to buy, a 36-inch, and then cut some off so you have that waste, if you buy it by the yard, then you can cut just exactly what you need. And um, in that package, I think she provides, they, they provide uh, so many, like, zipper pulls. So you can just, like, thread your zipper pulls on, and um, you're good to go. You can just cut whatever you need. Um, Pam Demore, she's the decorating diva. That's her business. So she has a lot of, uh, she knows a lot about curtains and she has a lot of notions for uh, home deck stuff in her store. So she's a good resource to check out just anyway. Absolutely. We both personally met her and she's wonderful, wonderful, so a so wonderful lady. So definitely support her. Um, our next question here comes from Connie and she asks, do I need a certain foot to make a ruffle with cotton fabric? You do not need a certain foot. Um, there is a foot, a ruffler foot, that you can attach to your sewing machine that kind of um, tucks the fabric under, and it does it really uniformly, so that's kind of nice. Uh, but you don't need it. Whenever I make ruffles, I always just uh, throw a line of basting stitches along the raw edge and gather it by hand. Um, it takes a little bit longer, but um, I like that kind of organic ruffle feel. So it's not completely uniform, but you get good ruffles anyway, and um, you don't need to buy a separate foot. Absolutely. All right, we have another question that just came in, and this one is from Marcia, and she says, I have a large number of patterns that are not my size. Can you recommend a good reference on how to uh, size up or down the pattern to fit? Most of these patterns are long out of print. Um, I don't have a specific reference that you can go to. I usually just, whenever I have a sewing question, um, I type it into my search browser and I just kind of do a little bit of research. So um, I read a lot of different sewing blogs. Um, so I don't have a specific resource to point you to, but um, there are a lot of there's a lot of information out there um, so you can do a little bit of sifting and find um, probably find exactly the information that you need. Absolutely. Can you give her just a couple tips on maybe how you go about sizing up or down a pattern? I mean not in like really large scale but even just a little bit? Yeah. Uh, oh, sizing up or down. Um, so always trace the pattern. Uh, trace the original pattern on, on the some paper first um, and then to size up, you would just want to take your measurements in a couple of areas, you know, your chest, your waist, your hip, and um, um, take the difference between your body measurements and measure the pattern. And then you can add on um, however much you need to those areas and then kind of follow the curve of the line of the pattern and draw that in. And to size it down, um, you're kind of just going to do the same thing. Um, but bringing the line in. And a French curve ruler is a really good resource, uh, a really good tool for, um, for pattern alterations and um, doing pulling in pattern lines and things because uh, it's got any kind of angle of curve that you need. You can just move that ruler around and trace your lines. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's a ruler you can find at, at a lot of um, sewing stores and fabric stores and things like that. 
Uh, okay, our next question that just came in is from Janet. Um, another question about zippers. And so she wants to know how to do an outside zipper, so more like a decorative zipper. And she wants to know how you would put that in a dress. Yeah, so like an exposed zipper, I think. Um, they have so many cool, uh, cool styles of zippers now. Uh, the zipper tape uh, has like prints on them and rhinestones and all these cool things. So exposed zippers are, are pretty easy to attach. Um, you just want to make sure your edges are, uh, you know, pulled under your edges. And then you really can just lay that zipper on. Uh, if it's a, a dress and you want to put the zipper on the center back seam, you can just lay it on and really just top stitch the edges of those zippers and, um, fo you know, fold the tape under at the top so that you don't have those, uh, like, pink edges of the tape at the top. Just fold them under, and um, that's really that's really all there is to it. Yeah, um, you mentioned rhinestones. I mean, if your zipper has rhinestones on there, be careful not to you know, sew through any of those or break any needles on that. So if you have to, you know, adjust where you're attaching it, that might be a good idea. Yeah. All right, so we have a couple questions um, that came in about this common topic here that says aging eyesight um, and threading sewing, machine, sewing machines is very frustrating. Any hints or recommendations for gadgets that will help make this easier? Yeah, so... You can check your machines. A lot of machines will have an automatic needle threader, uh, so just a lever uh, usually to the, to the left of the needle that you can pull down and thread your needle. Uh, but if it doesn't have that, I have seen this cool tool um, from Dritz. It's this little needle threader that's got an LED light on it. So uh, I've never used it, but uh, having that little LED light sometimes feels like it would be a... Uh, a good thing to have. It's kind of a nifty gadget. Yeah, it sounds like a spotlight on right where you need it to go. <laughs> Alright, next question that just came in here is from Christy and she says, what is the best way to insert a collar into a collar stand? Um, so, I always just have my collars, so you've got your collar um, constructed and you've got that raw edge that's going to be inserted into the collar stand. And you want to just sandwich that collar in between your collar stands and um, sew that seam and turn the collar stand right side out and it'll have everything closed for you. Um, I don't have any more specific tips than that without having a, you know, a sample in front of me. Um, Ashley, you make a lot of shirts. Do you have any? Yeah, I was actually going to say we actually have an article um, on National Sewing Circle called Collars, Cuffs, and Pockets and talks about all the areas of shirts and it shows you know, how to insert the collar in the collar stand and how to make adjustments to everything that. So if you want some more visuals to go along with that, um, that's definitely a resource to check out. And again, that's, that's on our website. You can find it there in the article section. Um, all right, our next question uh, comes from Kathy and she says, where do you buy embroidery blanks? Um, that has a good selection, uh, more than just things for kids. Um, embroidery blanks. I know there are a couple of big online stores for embroidery blanks that have like aprons and handkerchiefs and hats and all these things. What was that website? Um, I can't remember it right now, but you can you can search uh, embroidery blanks in your your search browser and it'll be one of the first ones that comes up is the one that I'm thinking of. Um, but I don't have a specific name right now. So <laughs> I'll think of it in like five minutes and shout it out. Okay, so Kathy be listening. If she just shouts out a random name, it's because she thought of, of the company where you can get those embroidery blanks. Um, another new question just came in and this is from Cora and she says, how do I decide which stabilizer to use with different fabric weights when embroidering? Good question, Cora. I love talking about stabilizer, and I'm not sure why. But um, you want to, in general, match the stabilizer weight to your fabric weight. So if you're using something really thin and lightweight, you're going to do like a water soluble, something thin. If you're embroidering on a canvas or something stiff and heavyweight, you'll probably want to use um, a cutaway or a, a stiff tearaway stabilizer because those are thicker. Um, so stabilizer, we have four main types. You've got your cutaway, which is the thickest and stiffest kind, and after you're done embroidering, you have to cut it away, as the name suggests, cut it away from the back. Um, so that kind of stabilizer stays 
on your project. You have your water soluble stabilizers, which when you're done embroidering, you wash away. Um, and that comes in a fabric type, so it, it's white and you know feels like fabric, and it also comes in a film variety. So if you're using a, a thinner fabric, um, <clears throat> you can use the film type because it's thinner than the, the fabric type, and that will wash away when you're done. Um, there's the tearaway kind, which is just like a nice mid-range kind. It's the kind that I always use. Um, unless I'm, you know, embroidering on a fabric that's super thick or super thin. There's, a, you know, a huge range of fabrics in between that you can use tearaway stabilizer on. Um, and that just tears away from, from the back of the embroidery when you're done. The needle will, you know, have perforated around the edges of the design and you can just tear that away. Um, and the, the stabilizer stays behind the thread. So that's a there are pros and cons to that. Um, it'll stay under to support the threads, but you'll see the white um, on the back of whatever project you're doing. Um, and then there's the heat removable variety, which I think it only comes in a film variety. And it's nice and thin, so you can use it on thin fabrics, and you just um, you touch it with the iron, and it kind of disappears. It doesn't go onto your iron, um, so it won't like gunk up your iron. It just kind of disappears. Um, if you're using that, make sure that the fabric that you have embroidered on won't be damaged by heat. Um, so yeah, in general, just um, match the weight to the fabric type. And if you're getting, if you're still getting puckers on your embroidery design or on your fabric around the design, um, <clears throat> you can try uh, multiple layers of the stabilizer type that you're using to offer some more support or go up. Um, to the next thickness of stabilizer. So it goes, you know, heat removal is thinnest, then water soluble, then tear away, and cut away so you can graduate up if you're still getting puckers. Awesome. Absolutely. There's so many different ones out there, but it sounds like there's definitely something for no matter what you're embroidering on. Yes. So I want to uh, thank everyone who has uh, already submitted questions. If you're just joining us, uh, again, you can submit questions for Nikki to answer. Um, for the next hour and do that by putting your question into the comment section below this video and we'll keep working our way uh, through questions. I do also want to let everyone know that we uh, just now released a new free downloadable guide and this is an ultimate sewing machine guide and you can get that right on our website and download it. It has all sorts of information on how to select a machine, how to buy one, how to set it up. Uh, clean it, care for it, everything you need to know about a sewing machine. So it's packed full of information. Again, you can download that on our site. So do that. I think you'll love it. Um, continuing on with our questions, we have uh, another question about embroidery since we're on that topic already. Uh, and Cora asks, how do I, oh, I'm sorry, I just asked that one. Cora says, do you always need to use a hoop when embroidering? Um, good question. No, you don't. Well, you have to hoop something. So you don't have to hoop the fabric, but you have to hoop your stabilizer. Um, so you have to have something that will sit in the hoop so that the hoop can move it around. Um, but if you're using a fabric that is a little bit thicker, um, that won't like fit in a hoop, or something that will get hoop burn, like velvet, where if you hoop it and you know pinch it tight in the hoop when you take it out, you, you see the ring on the fabric, you don't want to hoop that. Um, so you can just hoop your stabilizer and then use some spray adhesive, <clears throat> spray on the hoop and place your fabric just right on top of the stabilizer and adhere it. Um, and you don't have to deal with hooping it. Just make sure when you spray your stabilizer on your hoop, you're not getting it like all over your hoop because um, it can get like gunky and messy. Um, Make sure you, when you put your fabric over the stabilizer that you are um, aligning it correctly. So you, you want to mark your design center on your fabric and on your stabilizer and um, align those marks when you lay the fabric um, over the stabilizer and adhere it. All right. Um, our next question just came in. Uh, Jane wants you to expound on this curved ruler that we were talking about earlier. Uh, kind of explain what you would generally use it for as far as drafting and doing all sorts of pattern stuff. Yeah, so um, it's called a French curve ruler. Uh, it may sometimes be called a hip curve. 
or that might be a different ruler. I'm not sure if it has all the curves that a French curve ruler has on it. Um, but you can get it at uh, most uh, like fabric and craft stores. You can find it online if you search for French curve ruler. Um, it's got it's about you know 18 inches long. It's got a really um, it's got like a, a really angular curve at the end. Um, and then it goes from a really angled curve to kind of wider curve. So for the really angled curve at the top, um, you can use that for shaping arm size seams. And then the, the gentler slope um, down the one side can be used for uh, hip curves and waistline curves and things like that. And it also, mine also has a, a straight edge on the, the one side. Um, but I have a controller, so I don't really use that straight edge much. But it has it. You can use that. Yeah, and if you want uh, more information on that ruler and even just other rulers uh, that you would use for pattern making or alterations, uh, we have videos on National Sewing Circle called "You Know the Right Tools for Alterations." It goes through all the different rules, uh, rulers, and things that you would need. So that's another great resource. You can check that out, uh, and you'll actually get to see all the different rulers that that are out there that you can use. Um, next question here is from Jan, and she says, what is your method for keeping metallic thread from breaking? That's a good question, and that's something that comes up a lot when you're using metallic thread. So uh, first make sure you use, you're using a metallic needle. So they make metallic needles, they say metallic on it, specifically for metallic thread. It's got um, a bigger, a longer eye so that the metallic thread can go through without a lot of friction on the eye um, because if you know you're you're getting friction on the the thread it's gonna heat up and it's gonna shred and you'll get breakage um, so make sure you're using that and then um, you may also want to keep an eye on the way that the thread comes off the spool so if the spool is sitting um, horizontally on your machine uh, when it comes off the spool it'll it twists, and if it twists, you know, so much, it'll, you know, tighten up and break. So, um, if you're having a lot of, of breakage with your metallic thread, you can try setting it upright instead, so that it comes straight off the spool. And if your your pin doesn't uh, flip upright on your machine, uh, they sell tools that sit next to your machine that you can put spools on and have it be vertical, or you can like rig something up. I'm sure there's a way to set like a candle holder or something next to your machine so you don't have to buy something else. But um, that's another consideration um, when using metallic thread. Awesome. Um, our next question here is from Cynthia, and she says, can you sew shank buttons by machine using a zipper foot? That's a really good question. Um, and yeah, my instinct was to say no, but now that I think about it, I think you can actually. Um, so you want to just fold your fabric um, along where you want that button and have the fold sitting under your foot and have the shank sitting you know, next to it. And I think you can put on a zigzag stitch, lower the feed dogs, and go back and forth possibly. I haven't tried. I would think you would... Yeah, I think it would just depend on how big the shank is. Like, if it's really, really small, there may not be enough room. But if there's a big enough one, then, yeah, I think it would work. Hmm. I'm going to have to try it now. <laughs> yeah. Never done that before, though. Yeah. But I think I'd keep it nice and secure, too. So We're going to try it. We'll let you know. <laughs> All right, our next question here is from Lois. And she says, I'm wanting to make some sheer curtains for my bedroom windows. They aren't very long or wide, but I need some advice on how to measure them. I just want them to be gathered on the rod, um, and that you'd also like some material suggestions uh, that would be washable, machine washable. Okay. Um, so measuring for curtains, um, if you just want them gathered on the rod, so you'll probably, um, if you want two panels, you know, you'll measure the width of your window and Usually multiplying by two is kind of a good place to start for um, fullness of gathered curtains. Um, and then you know divide it by by two to get two different panels. Um, 
and for length, you can measure from where the rod will sit to where you want the curtains to end, whether it be the floor or just below the window. And if you want a um, any material sticking up above the rod, like a that's called a, the header of the curtain, um, add that into the measurement and make sure um, make sure that your rod pocket will be um, wide enough for your rod to go through is just a, a general tip. Um, and um, for the length, make sure you add uh, enough for the hem. Uh, curtain hems are generally kind of large, deeper hems. Um, and let's see. Curtain fabrics, um, something sheer that is washable. Um, you can check for um, some type of organza. It's a nice uh, sheer fabric that I believe is uh, washable. Um, but in the fabric store, you can look at the, the transparent fabrics, and it should tell you on the end of the bolt, too. Um, the fiber content, so if it's like a cotton poly or something, it'll be washable. Um, but if it's, you know, rayon, you'll want to be careful with it. Right. And if it's any kind of fabric that may shrink, I mean, just be sure to pre-wash all your fabric first. So if it's going to do any shrinking, it shrinks before you actually cut and sew your curtain. Uh, that way it doesn't end up shorter than you wanted it to. Yeah. So that's always a good thing, too. All right, next question, uh, another one about fabric. This is from Karen, and she wants to know how you can beef up fabric that's too thin for your apparel project other than just a lining. Um, other than a lining. So they make um, stabilizers that are really nice and thin. So that's the only other thing that I can think of to add, uh, add to your skirt so that it's not super see-through instead of using a lining. Um, but... It might also affect the drape in the hand, how, how the skirt falls. So um, keep that in mind. But um, adding some stabilizer is the only other thing I can think of other than aligning. Yeah, unless you just want to add like multiple layers and maybe make it layered or extra ruffled or just something to uh, give it more body that way too, that might work. Right. So, yeah. All right, another question here. Uh, this is from Doris. And she wants to finish woven, lightweight fabric seams. What is your suggestion for the seam finish? Uh, for finishing seams, I I like to just um, stitch in pink because it's it's easy and fast. Uh, just stitch um, a straight stitch along the edge and use your pinking shears. But another really uh, easy one to do is uh, zigzag stitch along the edge. Uh, that will works nice for woven lightweight fabrics. Um, you can also um, fold the edges under and stitch them. That takes, that takes a little bit more time. So I always just stitch in pink. That works. It works well. It gets the job done and uh, it's fast and easy and you can move on. Right. All about getting to your next project. I like it. All right, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about um, metallic thread. We talked a little bit about it before, but we have another question here from Rebecca. And she wants to know, does metallic thread harm the sewing machine, and does the metal wear on the machine elements? Uh, no, it does not harm your machine. Metallic thread is not actually made of anything metal. It's more like um, those shimmery ribbons, you know, that, that are on, like, party hats and things. You know, those things you blow for parties, it's got the ribbon. Um, that's just like iridescent and like metallic sheen. So it's just it's just a ribbon that's got that, that look to it. So it's not actually metal, so it won't harm your machine at all. Yeah. And just do the things like she mentioned before, uh, using the metallic thread, having, you know, your metallic needle and all of that to sort of help uh, just make the sewing with metallic thread uh, as easy as possible. Um, all right, we have another question here. This is about fabric. This is from Pauline. She wants to know what the difference between poly cotton, poplin cotton, and cotton are. All right. Um, 
So cotton is just going to be your cotton fibers um, woven, you know, however they weave it. You can use cotton a million different ways. So it's just going to be the cotton fiber spun into thread. Um, poly cotton is just going to be a, a blend of polyester and cotton. So they blend different fiber types to get the, the advantageous traits from both. So um, a poly cotton blend would be breathable like cotton um, and have the tear resistance of polyester and the uh, wrinkle resistant properties of polyester. Um, and poplin cotton would be, so poplin is just um, referring to the weave. <clears throat> So uh, poplin weave is just a plain weave, so it's one over, one under. Uh, so it's a nice, a nice breathable weave. And in days past, poplin used to actually mean a weave that was um, silk in the warp and wool in the weft. So that term has changed. So poplin these days just refers to the weave. Um, <clears throat> so... Uh, um, that weave is um, it's nice and breathable. It's it won't be as real wrinkle resistant like a twill weave might be. So um, um, it might still might wrinkle a bit. And um, what else was I going to say about a poplin weave? I'll think of it later and shout it out as well. But those are the basic basic differences between those. Uh -huh. Yeah, you never, I mean, there's more types of cotton and different types of fabric out there than I think anyone ever knew when they very first started sewing. I mean, I feel like every time I go to this, the fabric store, I see a new type of, of fabric that I didn't even know existed, and I just have to go home and, and search it and see what exactly makes it different from something I've used in the past. Right. Another question about fabric, this one comes from Josephine, and she says she has a project she wants to start making, and it's a purse out of an old leather coat, but she's never worked with leather before. Do you have any advice or tips for sewing with leather for the first time? Yeah. Um, so make sure you're using a leather needle. So they do make needles specifically for leather, and that has, um, it has a small eye, and it has a really sharp triangular point at the end, so it's really good at cutting through thick leather. Um, so when you're working with leather, you want to try and avoid uh, avoid too many seams. So so try and do as few seams as you can because just the more seams that you do, the bulkier it'll be, and you can only sew over so much bulk of leather. Um, so if you're crossing seams, it can be really tricky. Um, and don't press leather. You can't use an iron on it. If you want to press open seams, they make a roller tool to use to roll over, um, like a little steamroller, to press it flat, or you can finger press it flat. Um, and just make sure you keep in mind that when you're sewing with leather, it's not fabric, so it doesn't it doesn't really behave the same way as fabric, so it's not forgiving like fabric is. Um, and when you put a hole in leather, that's it. The hole is there permanently. It it won't. You can't hide it. Like if you you know stitch a seam in fabric, you can rip it out and try again. You can't do that with leather. Once you put that hole there, once you sew sew a seam, that those holes are going to stay there. Yeah, absolutely. So good good tips there for sewing with the leather. I'm talking about your, your roller. You know, if you don't if you can't find um, that roller that you're talking about. Honestly, just a rolling pin. I think I've used my rolling pin more in my sewing room than in my kitchen. So if you have things like that, you know, they can be multifunctional tools. You can use them in different areas of the house. So that's definitely what I've used. All right, another question here. This one is from Ebony. She wants to know what some good fabrics uh, are for beginner sewers and what some good, easy projects are for a beginner. Um, good fabrics to start out working with uh, you can't go wrong with cotton. Um, that's pretty easy to work with. I, and cotton poly blends are are nice to work with, like we were saying the characteristics of cotton poly. Um, <clears throat> anything with a nice tight weave is is nice and easy to work with. Um, so yeah, you can have your cotton fabrics that have a an open weave, and those are kind of nightmarish because they will fray and Every time you move it, it's going to shift on you. So a nice tight weave is really 
um, a nice thing to, to work with. You'll be able to mark on the fabric easier than if you have a, a more open weave. Um, so if you see anything with a twill weave, that's a good uh, tight, strong weave, and that's the weave that they use on denim for jeans. Uh, so that's a nice durable weave, makes for a good strong fabric, um, and that makes uh, fabric really good to work with. Um, bottom weights like broadcloth are nice to work with. Um, and as for beginner projects, uh, you can go on sewitallmag.com, S-E-W-I-T-A-L-L-M-A-G. Uh, they have a ton of cool projects, and sewitalltv.com also has projects that are designed and geared specifically for beginners, and they have lots of free patterns and stuff too, so that's a good resource for beginners to check out for projects. Absolutely. Also want to point out we've got quite a lot of beginner projects also on our site too, so I think we even have a little tab for beginner projects. So, I mean, there are so many different resources out there for sewing projects, whether you like them in written form or we have them in video form or you actually want the physical pattern, there's tons out there. Um, and then for fabric, like you were saying with your cotton, like if you ever walk into the fabric store and are confused about where the, you know, tight weave or loose weave cotton, I always just go straight to the quilting cotton section because I know that's like 100% cotton or the tight weave and it's got all the best prints anyway. So that's where I go and if you want, you know, that kind of cotton, that's a good section uh, to look at. All right, we have another question here. Um, this is from Claudette and she says, am I supposed to oil my machine? And if so, where do I put the oil? That's a good question and that's kind of a common question as well. Um, I wish I had a better answer, but all machines are different, so I can't say specifically. Um, I can just say consult your manual. And some machines actually will say not to oil your machine, so be careful of that. Some machines are self-lubricating, so adding extra oil would be harmful for it. Um, consult your manual. If it doesn't say in your manual where to oil the machine, don't oil it. Contact a dealer and ask. Um, uh, generally, if uh, if you know you can oil your machine, it's just going to be where the parts are moving parts touch, so in the bobbin case a lot of times. Um, but uh, consult your manual, and if it doesn't tell you specifically where to oil your machine, uh, do a little more research, contact a dealer, um, and see if you can get some information that way. But all machines are are different. Absolutely. And I, I I know too if you buy a machine and it comes out of the box and if it came with like a little oil pin or something, odds are you need to oil it. So a lot of times I'll come with it, you know, and tell you you need to do this. For sure. <laughs> okay. Um, we have some more questions here, but I want to remind anyone who's just joining us, or even if you've been following along the whole time, if you think of a question or even think of you know a follow-up on something that we've been talking about, go ahead and enter that question into the comment section below this video, and we're going to keep working our way through these questions. So our next question here is from Mary. She is wanting to make her own wedding dress and decorate it with pretty lace and fancy beads. Uh, what is the best material to use? Um, congratulations on the upcoming wedding and um, very ambitious making your own wedding dress. I know Ashley did that, so maybe she can talk about this too. Uh, but the best fabric is so subjective. Um, so for your special occasion fabrics, you know you've got your satins and all the variations thereof, taffeta, organza, um, uh, crepe, and you've got your laces and your tool and all of these things. Um, I'm partial to satin. Um, when you get a good satin, it's just there's nothing better. But like with anything, you can run into the, the cheap, low quality satins that will be crinkly and uh, super, uh, you know, easy to fray and all these things. So um, just it's, it's really important to be able to touch a fabric, especially for your wedding dress. You want to make sure you know what you're getting. So I would want to definitely see it in person and touch it and feel the drape and the hand of it. Um, 
But taffeta can sometimes be, you know, thin and crinkly. I just, I like satin, but Ashley might have a little more insight into this. Yeah, actually, I, I use satin as well, and she, she mentioned that she wanted to use um, both fabric and embellishments bought at Joann's, and that's actually where I bought my fabric, and I had little rhinestones and I had everything on there, and I got all of that there. So definitely that special occasions fabric aisle uh, is a, you'll find everything you need there, depending on your style, of course, but that's where I got everything, and it was, um, yeah, great fabric, and I really liked the way my dress turned out, so I thought it was perfect. It was beautiful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, and if anyone wants to see it, there's an article on National Sewing Circle, and you can look at pictures. <laughs> All right, our next question here is from Betsy, and she wants to make her own shoulder pads and wants to know where to place them. Um, shoulder pads, okay. Um, shoulder pads are they're pretty easy to make yourself. Um, it's just this shape, you know, it's got the curve at the top and then the, the straight edge at the bottom. Um, you can search for... Uh, shoulder pad template, type that in your search browser and you can probably come up with a template uh, as a good starting point and then you know, alter the shape if you need to from there. Um, so you'll want to cut two of those from an outer fabric, like a nice washable cotton, um, and then cut another from your whatever you want to pad it with, so foam or batting or layers of flannel, um, and take off your seam allowance uh, from the whatever you're stuffing it with. Um, so you'll cut that a little bit smaller than the outer pieces. Um, and then for the outer pieces, sew that curved edge with the right sides together, turn it inside out, um, stuff your, your, your padding in there, and then turn that, um, that straight lower edge under and stitch that. Um, and that straight lower edge is what you want to align with the shoulder seam of your jacket or shirt or whatever. Um, and so you'll want to mark the shoulder pad center line and align that center line with the uh, shoulder seam of the shirt. And um, you can, you know, alter the, the shoulder pad shape to, to get whatever shape you need to, but that, um, that straight edge is going to go along your, um, the arm's eye shoulder seam at the top. Absolutely. And again, if you want more visuals on that, uh, we do actually have a video. Again, on National Sewing Circle, we have a video on, we have videos on everything. We do have a video on uh, how to make a basic shoulder pad and how to, um, I believe she just does a basic sort of triangular shape, but then kind of explains how you can uh, change that shape as well. So uh, again, you know, we have tons of videos. Check us out. We have all sorts of things. All right. Another question here. This is from Jean. And she says, I know you need a ballpoint needle for knit, but can you use the same ballpoint needle on cottons? Um, the short answer is yes, but you want to be very careful. So the ballpoint needle, um, it's, it's just got, instead of a, a really sharp point at, at the tip of the needle, it's a little bit rounded, and that's to, to nestle in between the fibers of knits rather than um, cutting through them and possibly creating snags. Um, so it's not as sharp as a universal needle. So if you have uh, an open weave uh, cotton that you're working with, you can absolutely use it. Um, when you get into the tighter weaves and multiple layers is when you might want to be really careful with it um, because it won't pierce quite as easily as a universal needle. So you might run into skip stitches or... Um, even breaking your needle. So uh, the short answer is yes, but be careful. Test it out slowly. Yes. I'm a big fan of testing out new needles, new thread, new anything. Always test it out first. Yeah. All right. Um, we have another question here. Um, we've been getting a lot of questions uh, actually about uh, embroidery. And so this is another question. This is from Suzanne. She says she has a brother sewing machine that just happen to also be an embroidery machine, and she's not sure about what thread to use. So whenever you are embroidering on a machine, always use thread that is labeled embroidery thread. An embroidery th thread is um, generally a little bit thinner, so when you have all of those stitches kind of layered on top of each other, it won't be super bulky, and it has a really strong tensile strength. So when it is flying through that needle at high speeds, um, 
it won't hopefully won't break as much as if you're you would you know test try using a, like an all-purpose thread that won't won't do very well for embroidery so use an embroidery thread with your embroidery machine absolutely all right, another question here, um, which I have never thought about doing, so I want to see what your answer to this is, but Patty wants to know how you can sharpen your seam ripper. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I know some seam rippers you get, you just get attached to. If it dulls, you don't want to throw it out. Um, so you can use, um, I've heard of people using wet stones, like, uh, like my dad used to use to sharpen his jackknife. Um, using a stone to get into that, that little area. Or they also make um, small needle files. So it looks like, um, like a thin pencil that can get into that small area. I think that is called a, a small needle file. You can look that up. Good question. I guess I've, I've never just had one long enough that needs to I be sharp. I, I lose them before they need to be sharpened, and then I have to get a new one anyway. <laughs> All right, we have a question here, and Margaret wants to know um, where she can find plus-size, easy, affordable clove patterns. That is a good question, and I made a note on this. So let me just, because I found a really good resource. Curvy Sewing Collective. So CurvySewingCollective.com is a really great resource for plus size clothing patterns. They have a ton of reviews of uh, plus size patterns and they have links to all the different um, pattern lines that have plus size options. So um, that's a really good place to start to, to check out that. Absolutely. Awesome. All right, so I, I still want to remind people that they can be um, asking questions along. Uh, we still have about a half hour or so to go, so if you have any questions that you want to have answered, again, submit those into the comment section below this video. I also want to remind everybody or inform you if you've just joined us about our new uh, free downloadable guide available on National Sewing Circle. And this is an ultimate sewing machine guide. So if you're thinking about buying a new machine or maybe upgrading your machine, um, it's a good resource. has a lot of information. And I think you'll really get a lot out of it. All right, so our next question here, um, we have a question that was submitted by Denise. And so she says, when a pattern says to baste, what is the best method to baste? That really depends on the type of fabric you're using. So if you are using just a uh, regular woven cotton, you can baste on your machine and just uh, bump the stitch length up all the way and you can baste that way. Um, if you're using a lighter weight fabric, you might want to hand baste and just thread your hand sewing needle with a single length of thread and just do really long stitches uh, for your basting. Um, if you are using a, a fabric that is really slick and slippery, like maybe a, a slinky jersey knit or even a satin that um, gets a lot of, of slippage between layers, you might want to use a water-soluble um, usable tape. Uh, and you can align that right along uh, the raw edge and actually um, iron it to really adhere those layers together um, for when you're stitching your seams and then the water soluble tape will wash out afterwards. So that's um, a quick and easy uh, method for making sewing satin less nightmarish. <laughs> right. That's a good, good tip then. Less nightmarish. <laughs> All right, we have another question here, um, and Barbara wants to know how many years one should keep their embroidery machine before upgrading. Uh, that there's no real rule on that. That all depends on you and the machine. So you don't ever have to upgrade if your machine is working well for you. Um, it doesn't, you know, break anything. Um, but if you find yourself growing out of it and you want more features or you know, a larger area, more built-in stitches or something like that, then it might be time to upgrade. But it all depends on you and the type of projects you're doing and what your needs are as you grow and evolve as a sewist. 
Absolutely. I would sort of use the same guidelines about when you're thinking about upgrading your sewing machine. I mean, it's kind of the same thing with embroidery machine, too. So as long as it's doing what you need it to do, it's probably fine. Hmm. All right, a question here. This is from Susan, and she says, what stitch should I use to stitch elastic to the top of a slip or to use as the waistband of a skirt? Good question. Um, so whenever you are sewing a seam that needs to stretch, you want to use a stretch stitch. So either a zigzag stitch or a triple stitch, um, which stitches, uh, you know, two forward and one back or something like that. So that um, it's like a tiny zigzag stitch in between two straight stitches. So when you pull, that stitch will have some give to it. Uh, so when you are attaching elastic to the, to the top of the skirt and the elastic is going to show and just be your waistband, um, align the raw edge of the skirt with the edge of the waistband, uh, have about a quarter inch of the skirt sticking up above the, the elastic, um, and stitch using your stretch stitch um, just right along the edge of the elastic. And if you're using a zigzag stitch, um, instead of having both needle swings stitching on the elastic, I always do um, have you know the left needle swing stitch into the elastic and the fabric and the right needle swing stitch just off of the elastic, so stitching just into the fabric layer. Um, because the more the needle pierces your elastic, uh, the quicker it'll wear out is the idea. And I don't know if it'll wear out all that much quicker if you have both of, of the needle swings piercing the elastic. That's just what I was taught, so that's what I always say. Uh, would you recommend doing like a casing or something instead? It maybe if you're worried about stitching through the elastic, maybe you know attaching it that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you're worried about the elastic, definitely use a casing. Um, but a lot of elastics are like if it's a really a wide elastic, that's kind of what it's made for is to just be your waistband, so you don't have to mess around with the casing. And elastics too are getting kind of fun and funky, just like those zippers are, they make elastics with fun prints and like glitter and things like this. So it's made to be seen, it's made to be um, just used as your waistband. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we have another question here, um, and this comes from Kimberly. She says, is it possible to use binding trim with my serger, or should I just stick to the regular sewing machine? Um, I think you should probably stick to the regular sewing machine. Um, on the serger, you could you could disengage the blade, but I think the stitches, the way the stitch forms, it would still it would like cover up the, the binding. Um, so I think just the regular straight stitch on your sewing machine is the way to go when attaching binding, probably. I second that answer, absolutely. <laughs> All right, um, a next question here is from Ruth. This is another one uh, actually to do with elastic waistbands. And so she wants to know when changing an elastic waistband, how many inches do you deduct um, because she doesn't want the waistband to be too tight. Right. So I always just do uh, my waist, my measurement where the elastic is going to sit, minus one. Um, and then when I overlap the elastic edges, I overlap them by one inch, so it winds up being two inches smaller than the circumference of my body. Um, and you can test that out and see if it would be too tight or uncomfortable um, and adjust from there. But um, that's always what I do because I make, I do the elastic on skirt waistbands and I, ha I always have, you know, pockets and everything that I make. So I'm carrying my phone and my keys in my pockets and it, it pulls so I want it really nice and, and snug so that my my phone, the weight of the things I put in my pocket isn't you know, pulling my skirt down, so I like it nice and, and snug. But test it out and see if that would work for you. That's that's my method. Yeah, absolutely. Just cut the piece of elastic and like wrap it around yourself too and make sure it's, it feels you know comfortable and how you want it to feel. All right, another question here. This um, comes from Althea, and she wants to know how to put in an invisible zipper. That's a really good question. I wish I had a visual. Uh, I asked my mother-in-law for an invisible zipper, and she's like, I'm a quilter. I don't put in zippers. Cute. Um, but invisible zippers, I love putting them in because they are actually really easy. Um, 
So you want to unzip the zipper and kind of roll the coil outward um, and press it with your, your iron on low heat. So uh, roll the coil outward and pressing it will kind of keep it open so that you can get your needle right in that groove right next to the coil, uh, the zipper teeth coil. Um, and align it onto your fabric and using your zipper foot to get as close to the, the coil of the teeth as you can. You can stitch just right along. It's this really nice little groove um, for your needle to go down. And that is how, uh, getting really close to the teeth, that is how you get it to be so nice and invisible in your seam. Uh, so when you zip it up, that seam is like really uh, kind of on top of the teeth. Yeah, absolutely. I wish I had a visual, but hopefully that helped. Well, believe it or not, we have a video <laughs> on how to install an invisible zipper, again, on nationalsciencecircle.com. So you can find that there. We have a whole section on zippers, actually. So you have any zipper questions, we've got a whole section on it. Okay. All right, our next question here um, comes from Teresa. And she says, why is it that my sewing machine skips a stitch and the underside is just all loops? So skipped stitches, I think we got a lot of questions about skipped stitches this time. That's a, that's a problem that, you know, most people encounter at some point or another when they're sewing. Um, there are a lot of different reasons that that could be happening. So make sure your, your machine is threaded correctly in the needle and in the bobbin. Uh, make sure it is, the, the machine is free of lint and dust, so make sure it's good and clean. Uh, make sure you're using the right type of thread for your needle. Um, so if you're using a thread that is too large for your needle eye, uh, when it goes through the fabric, um, the, if the fabric is moving at the seam, you get what's called flagging. So the fabric is kind of going dun, 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 dun. You might even hear that kind of popping sound. Um, the, the heavy thread is, you know, pushing the fabric down and it doesn't catch the bobbin thread when it comes back up. So make sure the, the, the thread weight to the, the needle eye ratio is correct. Um, and make sure your needle obviously is uh, not dull. So um, change your needle after every project. That's generally what I do because they say change it after every six hours of sewing or whatever, but I can never keep track of that. So just after every project, um, I change the needle. And there are certain fabrics that'll dull your needle faster. So if your last project you were sewing on fleece, your needle is probably going to be dull, and that's why you're having to skip stitches. Um, so make sure to try and change your needle, see if that will help. Um, and yeah, that's, I think that's my checklist for skip stitches. And make sure your tension um, is, is right for your fabric as well. So you can play around with the needle tension as well. That's my checklist. Absolutely. Perfect. Good checklist. Just work your way through that. I mean, hopefully the very first one you try fixes it. But if not, you know, keep working your way through and, and see if, if all those solutions work for you. All right, we're coming towards the end of the hour. So if you have any questions, you know, get those. In and we will answer them. Um, you know, if you didn't think of a question tonight, but you have a question you want to submit, you can email us at any time. We will also answer your questions there. You can also connect with us on social media, on Facebook and Pinterest and Twitter. Uh, we love to hear from people. We love seeing what you're working on um, and hearing, you know, what you like to share about sewing. Um, we have another question here, and this is from Linda, and she says. I am all thumbs when I even attempt a small applique project. Can you suggest some tricks of the trade? Sure thing. Also, let me just say allstitch.com has a lot of embroidery blanks. Just a crazy there we go. We knew you would come up with it. <laughs> yep. Steel trap up here. I knew it was there. Um, so applique. Um, if you're using really small pieces of applique, a tweezer is a really great tool to use because um, when you're doing applique, you know you've got your uh, your spray adhesive or whatever and your glue and your fingers are sticky and you're trying to use all these little pieces that are sticking to your fingers. Um, a pair of tweezers to, to place your uh, little tiny applique pieces 
uh, with precision. That Those are a really great tool to use. Uh, that's my only tip. Ashley, do you have any other tips? I think, well, it depends on the type of applique you're doing. I know that the first type, type of applique I actually did was reverse applique, where you actually have the fabric under and you stitch your design, and then you cut out the top. And that takes like a lot of the hassle out of it, because all you have to do is stitch a shape and then cut fabric. And so that's like the easiest type to do. Um, but then, yeah, as far as, you know, just regular applique, um, maybe practice with some raw edge applique first so you're not having to worry about turning those edges under or being super precise, things like that. Um, and then if I was doing turned edge applique, uh, tons of starch. Like, that's yeah. definitely really going to keep everything nice and flat uh, and even, and then, um, then you can get your pieces all in place. But, uh, yeah, definitely sort of, like, work your way or ease your way into the more complicated applique. That's what I would do. All right, we have time for just a couple more questions. Um, this one comes from Janet, and she says, could you please explain how a narrow hem foot works? Yes. So a uh, narrow hem foot is really great. Um, it will kind of fold, double fold your fabric for you as you're sewing and kind of does all those steps in one. Um, and it's great for using with thin. Um, so here is, this is the narrow hem foot that I found in my mother-in-law's house. So it's got this really funny looking like curly Q shell. And it has this, um, the groove on the underside for the, the hem to follow as it go as it, the foot goes over it. So... However wide this groove is, that's the width that you need to double fold your fabric. So you, you have to double fold your fabric for yourself for a couple of inches along the, the first edge. Um, and either just you know press it or put a pin in it and stitch a couple of stitches with your foot on, um, two or three stitches, and then try and work that fold into this little seashell curly Q shape. You can use that, uh, a stiletto to try and kind of, you know, wiggle that in there. And then once the fabric gets into that curly Q shape, it's your, um, your first fold. Yeah, your first fold will get kind of tucked in there. Um, and then you just stitch along and holding the fabric kind of up, it'll curl into that foot. This is the kind of thing, Ashley, if you guys have a video on. This is the kind of thing that you, you want to watch a video on because trying to like find a, a blog post about it, it's kind of hard to understand unless you can see it in action. Um, and all feet are different, um, so you can gauge on your foot where you need the fabric to be to get a uniform hem. Um, but yeah, you, you just kind of feed the fabric in as as you're stitching along and it, it double folds it for you so it's one step instead of three and once you master it it's a really great tool and they make them in a bunch of different widths so this is this was a really tiny narrow one and this one is a a bit wider so there's a a foot for um, whatever lots of different applications for your for your hemming needs Absolutely, and of course we have videos on all sorts of hems on the site as well. All right, we have one last question, and I wanted to get to this one and end with this one because I thought um, it kind of went along with a story that you first told us about when you were making clothes when you were very young, and this question comes um, from a 12-year-old, and Haley wants to know what is the best way to make yourself clothing without a pattern. Haley, thank you for the question, and I'm so glad that you're getting into sewing. It is a great, great hobby, uh, creative outlet. Um, so I, I did a lot of guessing when I first started out. I started sewing when I was like 11. Um, and to, to stitch without um, stitch clothing without patterns, um, I did a lot of draping. So in addition to you know just kind of guessing and cutting out what pattern shapes I thought would make sense. I did a lot of draping. So I didn't have a dress form back then, so I was like draping fabric on myself in the mirror. It wasn't ideal, but it worked. So if you're draping fabric on yourself or on a dress form, 
I always did it with the wrong side out so that I could use my chalk marker or my uh, water soluble pen to mark uh, my seam lines um, on myself. So if it's on the wrong side, you'll be able to see it better, um, typically. And then lay the fabric out, and you can trace those marks to make yourself a pattern shape. And then I would recommend tracing that pattern shape on the paper so that you have it for later use if you want to make this thing again or um, for when you are going back and after you make the thing and be like, oh, this needs to be different. So you can make the changes onto a paper piece. Uh, it's a lot easier than trying to make the changes onto, onto the fabric. Um, so just playing around with it, I did a lot of a guessing on pattern shapes, but um, it's, it's a good way to learn actually is just by trial and error and doing it yourself. It was, it was a great education for me, so I'm really glad that you're getting started in it. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Haley, we hope to hear from you uh, in years forward, and we'd love to see some of the things that you make. You know, if you want to, you know, submit those to us either on Facebook or you know, send us the emails of, of things that you're you're working on. We'd love to see that. We'd love to see uh, anything that anybody's working on. We definitely we're all about sewing here. Um, so we want to know what you guys are making as well as you know, show you what we're making. Um, so. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight, and thank you, Nikki, for answering all of our questions. Uh, again, if you have questions that you you know think of later, feel free to email those to us. And we'll just one last time, I'm going to remind everyone to download that free sewing machine um, guide. It has all the information you need to know about sewing machines. Since we did get a lot of questions about machines, uh, I think that's something that you'll really find useful and helpful. So um, thank you again, everyone, and we hope you will join us again next month when we do our next National Sewing Circle live event. Everyone have a good night. <laughs>